All right, everybody, welcome back to the Move Podcast. Brought to you each and every time by Aura Ring. Everything starts with sleep, monitoring your sleep, tracking your sleep, just knowing all the key details of sleep and 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 from there how you affect it and hack it. Um, sleep affects everything, mental clarity, physical performance, um, all of it. It all starts with sleep. Get to know your sleep a lot better. Head on over to Aura Ring, O-U-R-A Ring.com. I'll send you a sizing kit and start tracking. Uh, I'm Lance Armstrong out here in the desert of uh, Utah. You like this backdrop, boys? That's a photo. That's a green screen. No, no, it's not. <laughs> this is, uh, I came out here to celebrate the 25th anniversary of 10 2 with the missus. So we're just out here just chilling. It's amazing. I got Johan back in Madrid. Johan, I miss you, man. I miss you too. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been like three huh? days. Yeah, yeah. George, uh, the hotel magnet over there at the Hotel Domestique and uh, outside of Greenville. Yep, miss you guys. Happy uh, 10-2, Lance. Thank you, brother. It's been a crazy 25 years. <laughs> you can say that again. Uh, and JB, holding down the fort in Austin, Texas. This town's going nuts. Austin oh, City Limits Festival is going yep. on. MotoGP out at Circuit of oh, the wow. Americas. It's on. It's just going crazy. Damn. That's the only thing I've been to. I've never been to the F1 out there, although we're considering going this year. But uh, I, I did go to the MotoGP once. That's that's insane. I think you're all booked up that weekend, Lance. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be back. I'm going to oh, be back. I have a lot of stuff that weekend. I'm, uh, <laughs> there's a slight chance I roll out to Greenville for my buddy's uh, bike ride. Um, try, try my best. You know what I'm saying? Uh, okay. <laughs> You'll be here. <laughs> But, hey, the, 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 but back to business. This is the first Perry Roubaix in two and a half years. I mean, they, you kind of forget time flies, of course, but, uh, you know, the COVID situation uh, and, and the first one maybe that we've seen in the fall, maybe, I don't know what they did back in the day, but epic race. Uh, first, what'd you say, Johan, the first wet Roubaix in 19 years? Yeah, that's, that's what they said. Um, I mean, as far as I can remember, the last decade, last 15 years, there's not been any, I mean, it's been muddy sometimes, yep. but really raining. Uh, I think it was 19 years ago. Yeah. So nobody yeah. of every, nobody of all the participants in, in this Paris Bay had ever raced uh, in the rain in Paris Bay, which, you know, it makes, makes it a whole different race. Well, yeah, you, I, saw some, it, I saw some stuff on Twitter. They were just, just sort of mentioning that it's been two and a half years. Uh, Tade Pogachar was, was a Neo pro the last time they did Roubaix. Um, uh, Primoz Roglic had never won a grand tour hmm. and Enios at the time was team sky. Like they, these are all things you're like, what? It was interesting. Yeah. Just, the, the, the days leading up to the race, like the photo of George is like the go-to photo on socials for almost every outlet. I'm like, there's George again. There's George again yeah. with the muddy yeah. face from, from, uh, you did two muddy Roubaix, right? I did it more than two because my first one was muddy in 1994 uh, was it was snowing in the morning when I woke up uh, oh, for wow. my first Paris Roubaix and I was I had nothing but excitement uh, and just I was so excited to be there felt like a dream come true racing with guys like Steve Bauer and Sean Yates at the um, one of the, the most iconic one day race in the entire planet it was snowing I just felt like the weather was perfect for me and the, of course I ended up getting crushed, but I finished the race. I think only 40 guys finished the race out of 220 guys that year. And I was like 20 something place um, and just fell in love with the race after that. <laughs> You're sick. You're sick <laughs> motherfucker, man. How many times, how many times did you do Parito Bay, Lance? Um, you know, I never did it and I never wanted to do it. It's a, it, it, I know you're fucking with me, but I just, <clears throat> no, no, it's the true, uh, true, true answer. I, I, you know, I had no desire and it wasn't, I guess, it, of course, would have been or could have been different if, if the race was held in the fall. But for us, and back me up here, Johan, like this is a dangerous race. Like a lot of mm. we've seen, you know, you've seen career ending injuries here. It just wasn't worth it in April um, to, to do that before the tour. Yeah. Um, but, and, you know, you go back in the day, he know, of course, uh, Bernard, you know, could could win Perry Bay and also win the tour. But. Yeah. yeah, but he he know he know did it once. You know, he know he know just did it because uh, he thought it was you know a crazy race. But he said, you know, 
I'm going to go win it and then never go back. No, but it wasn't it that they, uh, because he was obviously the great French champion, the great, but it, it, it has such an allure that he was, he's, they started to criticize him. Like mm-hmm. you can't exactly. be a great, yeah. you can't be one of the greatest French riders of all time and have never done Roubaix. Yeah. If year after year after year, they told him that. And finally he goes, okay, fuck y'all. I'm going to go do it once. And then, and then on, top of that, on top of that, being being world champion. Yeah. Mm. yeah. yeah. And then, Lance, you got to go back a bit to you, you kind of glossed over it. I mean, you made a great point. The the a dry Roubaix is like crazy dangerous, incredibly hard. A wet Roubaix, like you're almost guaranteed to crash at least once. Mm-hmm. And when you crash on those cobbles, there is a high probability that you're going to get really messed up. Right. Um, you've seen a lot of guys going down. Musea was out for a year or two with the knee injury. And guys, you, you fall on those cobbles, you don't know what's going to happen. Um, and it's just, uh, it, it's it's amazing to see these guys going in there, full gas, positioning. I mean, I was sitting on my couch just sweating watching this. I was just so excited to watch a rainy Roubaix because that's the ultimate discipline of the sport of cycling. I mean, it doesn't matter how good you are of a bike handler, you're going to slip and slide. It's yeah, how quickly it. you can react. And you can see these guys towards the end of the race, they start getting tired, mentally fatigued. They're running out of energy. And those little slip and slides that have been happening through the first 200 kilometers now become crashes. Um, so it's just a super exciting race to watch. And particularly today was just incredible. It was a, it was a war. Today was a, yeah. a war. You saw the guys coming in. Seeing these you, guys you, on the, these, these stretches that are that essentially they're crowned, right? So you've got um, just, you know, a hundred years of, you know, all kinds of traffic, right? Back in the day, horse and buggy to automobiles to, but they're crowned and it was so slippery that you see these guys that they had to stay right in the middle. The second they got a little over to the side when it started to fall off, slip city, man. It was like, dude, that is even the, I'm sure you noticed, even the enduro motorcycles that are built for unbelievable conditions couldn't stay upright. I mean, right. that's a testament to how slippery it is. Well, and they take, you know, these, the, the, those are the, you know, the gendarmes in France, uh, typically that protect most races, whether it's the tour or, or, um, you know, other, uh, road events and in, in France, ride They ride, uh, you know, BMW, you know, classic street bikes, but for this one, they have to bust out the, the dirt bikes. I mean, it's, that's always, you always know it's Roubaix when you see that. Yeah. yeah. Well, today also, not only were there crashes and slips and slides on the cobbles, I mean, Basically, every roundabout they went through, three or four guys were going down and they were going down hard. I mean, you saw Peter Sagan uh, perhaps a bit off today because he's always kind of trying to fight to get back to the position, maybe perhaps taking a few extra risks than he would normally when he's 100 percent. But man, that one crash when he was coming around there on that right hand bend and went to the curb at, you know, 30 some odd miles an hour. Uh, you just hate to see that. That's uh, those those crashes are awful. And it's really hard to come back from that in the. 200 kilometers into a race like Roubaix. Yeah. Hey, uh, George, George, you as, as a specialist, sorry, Lance, as a specialist, uh, Paris Roubaix. Um, so we saw today two guys who were, who were for part of the first breakaway, um, Vermeers and Moscon are in the top four. Do you think the fact that you're in the front all the time, of course, it's hard running in the front, but you know, of course, you don't. Then you don't have to pay, uh, fight for position. You know, it's not so stressful. Does that actually balance out all the efforts you have to do, being in the peloton, moving up, going around people, so that at the end, uh, it's kind of equal. The guys who have been in the in the in the breakaway and the guys, the big guys like Cobrelli and and Van der Poel. Hundred yeah. percent, absolutely, yeah, totally. Uh, totally. Because we saw it when uh, when Boonen did his first Paris Roubaix, and you guys kind of put him to get into the early breakaways. Well, it was very similar today. He got in a breakaway of, you know, 20 to 30 guys. And of course, that's a very hard effort to make that breakaway. Once you make that breakaway, things become a lot easier. You're not battling with 200 guys to get to the front. You only have to battle with 15, 20 guys in the breakaway. You can really choose your lines. You're not so worried about guys crashing in front of you. And if you play it right, and every each time you, once the breakaway is established, each time you pull through, I like to call it fake pulling. You kind of just pull through at 70%. And you know, a lot of the guys are excited. They're pulling through at hundred percent. Well, they're not thinking about the finish. They're thinking I made the breakaway in Paris. I'm going to be on TV all day. My family's watching me. Well, a couple of those guys are actually thinking, hang on a second. I might be able to make it to the finish line. So each time they're coming through, they're going to pull through a little bit less than the other guys. Um, When you got two, three minutes at that point, it's not about, you know, gaining more time. It's about keeping that time and now starting to save energy and not battling for position with guys like in the back, Van, Van Ard, Vanderpool, Cabrelli. I mean, they're going full gas. They're battling for position. They're trying to stay upright. 
So it's it's two races going on, but guys like um Moscon today and Vermish, they had they had a huge advantage being in that breakaway. They worked hard to do it, um, but they definitely had an advantage. And not to mention, this comes at the end of a long season, right? This this race, you know, people, if it's in April, people come in just chomping at the bit. You know, it's still Perry Roubaix. And, you, and we saw Sonny Cobrelli's reaction at the finish line. Obviously, it, it didn't matter if, if this thing was on Christmas Day, right? He was that, it's, it's still that big a deal, very emotional for him. Uh, and, actually, uh, you, you, I don't think we've ever seen this before. Johan, correct me if I'm wrong, because you're the encyclopedia of cycling. But have we ever seen... The final move of the Paris Roubaix, three guys, whatever it was. Today was three guys, but have we ever seen that move be all, all the whole breakaway? Somebody who has never done Roubaix before, because all three of those guys have never raced Roubaix. Uh, first of all, first of all, once again, you know, we are we are witnessing changes in cycling. This is again, you know, the theory that you have to get the experience in Paris Roubaix and that you have to get the endurance. It all goes through the window once again. So, uh, of course. You know, Colbrelli is a seasoned professional. Van der Poel, even if he didn't never do the race, he was still one of the favorites. Uh, but, you know, a young professional, only 20, 22 years old, first year professional, uh, Florian Vermeers, being there and being second. Um, nah, that, uh, for sure, that has never happened. Uh, it, 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 until until this year, it was unthinkable. I think everybody would have said, no, you're crazy. You have to well, do I it think, a few times I, first. I, I think the fall factor... I think that that's definitely, into it. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, this yeah. is, uh, Hey guys, uh, a little bit of business today's show also brought to you by Roca. This is a company I've been rocking for years. Uh, Rob and the whole crew down in Austin, amazing athletes. They got it all for you on the bike, off the bike. Um, you know, you, you folks probably saw a lot of the pictures and stuff. And, uh, uh, there were some pictures of me, uh, actually dropping George. I finally got him uh, there in Mallorca at the move camp, uh, towards the end, but I uh, had the, you know, rock and the Roka shades there. Also the readers, Johan, Johan stole a pair. Look at Johan. He's got, he stole those readers for me. That's the new Lockhart <laughs> reader. Uh, they're amazing. Um, and th- dude, they look great on you, by the way. Uh, special offer for our listeners, 20% off. Head on over to Roka.com and enter the move. All one word to check out 20% off. Today's show also brought to you by LMNT. So, speaking of go-tos, this is my go-to hydration source. There's no crap in it, no junk, no sh- no sugar, a um, bunch of different cool flavors and a special offer uh, for our listeners. By the way, 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, 60 milligrams of magnesium, all the good stuff, no crap. Uh, special offer, head on over to drinklmnt.com slash the move, and they'll send you a free sample pack just for the cost of shipping. You can try out all the different flavors and take it from there. Um, can we talk about Sonny Cabrillo? That that was, and I was watching, uh, Anna was watching the end of it. And she was like, wow. Like I've never seen somebody that emotional. Mm. Yeah. I mean, that was, and by the way, you know, and you, again, you're just reminded of the time of year. You also never would see anybody laying on grass, that color of green in <laughs> Perry Roubaix, right? That's just it. Uh, man, he was. Yeah. Well, I mean, was, today, I mean, today's race, today's conditions, um, you know, being Paris Roubaix, the one arguably the hardest one day race in the world and you no throw doubt. on rain, cold weather. I mean, that's as big or bigger than the world championships last weekend. And, you know, I, I think he had every right to be emotional. I mean, we didn't, we haven't, we haven't really seen that kind of emotion at the finish line, but he was, he was all into it. And you know what? He rode an incredible race and nobody's mm-hmm. really talking about all the moves he made after the Aaron Burke. He went on his own. And I'm thinking, what's he doing? He's got a long way to go, but he's going group to group to group. And then finally, Vanderpool comes up with a huge amount of horsepower. And you think that he's way stronger than Cabrelli. But, and I think, I think actually Vanderpool thought that too, because he kept doing all the work, kept trying to drop those guys. And Cabrelli was just there, there, there the whole time and rode an absolutely perfect race. And yeah, this and was, even, a, this was on, a race, sorry, Johan, this was a race yeah. that, that, uh, you know, in our era was, I was kind of dominated by the Italians. The Italians haven't won Perry Rebay in, you know, 20 some odd years, uh, Andrea Toppy being the last winner uh, yeah. to come from Italy. And, uh, mm-hmm. that, that, that's, uh, that's another big story. I mean, y- yeah, uh, that's huge. I mean, you, but back in our day, you had Ballerini and Toffee and, you know, a bunch of these legends. Um, so first one in over two decades. Yeah. And even, even George, uh, on Carrefour de l'Arbre, everybody thought that, you know, Van der Poel would go, but actually you could start to see there that, well, the pool was running a bit out of gas and, uh, and Colbrelli actually went himself. So yeah. that was the sign that uh, already there, we knew that Van der Poel would not drop Colbrelli. 
Mm. Uh, and, and I think that there also Van der Poel had decided, okay, I'm just going to st- try to hang on and, and try my luck in the sprint. But I think today uh, he, 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 was, he was empty at the end. Uh, that was, was clear. And, like and in, I, keep t- I keep saying it, but I, I think that's just a, a, a consequence of... Think, think about the long the season this guy's had. I mean, there's yeah. just, you know, it's just, did you, the, at some point uh, the engine just gets worn down and you could see it in him today. I mean, that's, that's, he didn't look like the same, although he was there. Uh, that yeah. didn't look like the same guy. Well, I think I think, we, I think before they talk about the season, we got to talk about what happened in the in the race. I mean, I think he had uh, two mechanicals, one crash before before any of this shit had started to happen. So let's go back like 200k to go. He's off the back, going to through two or three groups, and is finally in the big group. Sees Van Aert have a little bit of trouble in the Arenberg, pushes the pace, and uh, you know from then on, it was him trying to just be super, super aggressive. And eventually that's going to catch up to you. And uh, it definitely caught up with him today on, on the capital there, even though he made the first move. Yeah. And, and I think like, especially on a course like today with the mud, you know, this guy's cyclocross skills were just, you know, that's, I mean, you could see on, in all the corners, he took one or two seconds on everybody else. Um, but, you know, a, a total, total unfair advantage. I mean, well, <laughs> it, it is what it, it, no, it's not unfair. It is what it is, but it's a huge advantage. If you think it is, about it, is, it is an incredible advantage. But the fact that he could never, you know, he tried a few times and he could never get away really from them. He tried, you know, first this uh, Canadian champion, that guy did an amazing race too. Uh, what's his name? Bovin. Bo- yeah, Bovin. Bovin. He, he uh, you know, he would have he would have been close also. I mean, he would, wouldn't have won, but he would have been top five, I think, if he if he didn't crash. Hmm. Um, but like you know, the, he he was first with Van der Poel, and Van der Poel didn't get uh, didn't manage to get rid of him. Uh, so that was already a little sign that you know he was good. But the right away, he uh, he would have had to be a little bit stronger, I think. You know, like in all all wet Roubaix, uh, Johan and Lance. I mean, luck what, is what, a huge what, what factor. What about JB and JB? Luck is a huge factor. <laughs> I mean, we're talking about crashes. All these guys. I think all the guys in the first of the finish there, they either crashed or flatted at some point. But with Muscan. We all thought, Johan, you said the race was over. He's he's holding a minute and 20 gap, not losing any time, looking super strong. What happens? Boom, he gets a flat tire. And he rode the flat probably a bit longer than we would have liked to have seen. Changes the, the bike. Then you're on a different bike. You get all kinds of stress going on, more than you had in the beginning because you're about to win Paris Bay. And then, boom, he crashes. So those two things completely mm-hmm. changed the whole outcome of the race. I mean, so, that could have been a much different race. George, you, you, you just said this a second ago, and I meant to ask you, so you see, you called it the hardest one day race on the calendar. Yeah. Um, which I, as we've discussed, I never did the race. So I, 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 you know, I have no idea, but you think it's harder than, than tour Flanders. I'm talking like uh, in terms of muscle damage is definitely harder than any bike race you do. And on the calendar, Flanders is obviously super hard. Uh, you know, very, uh, it's a race of attrition as well. The cobbles just aren't quite as rough as Roubaix. The Roubaix, there is no, there's no consistency to the cobbles. I mean, you have these massive rocks on either side of you. It's like Flanders, the, the cobbles are hard, but they're very consistent. So you know what you're going to get. Roubaix, you don't know what's coming around the next corner. Of course, all these guys do recon, so they try to figure out as much as possible. But the lines in a wet Roubaix, when you're taking those corners, it's life or death. If you you got to pick your perfect line or you might not come out of that corner. I, I said it to my, my boys I was watching the race with this morning. I went into, I think it was Mont uh, uh Johan, you were in the car thinking, hell yes, I am in the best position of my entire career in Roubaix. And I came out of that section in an ambulance. You never know what's going to happen in a wet in a Roubaix. It's interesting too. It's it's uh, and then we could pull this up on Strava just to see the total vert because a lot of these days we talk about you know we're always so impressed by some of the days 10, 12,000 feet of vertical. I mean the only climb in Perry Roubaix is an overpass. Like so, to see, to hear you describe just how demand physically demanding it is, and if we went and looked at the total vert, it would be basically nothing. Um, it just goes to show you how much those cobbles rock you, you know, and you, you well, come think- out of the section of uh, the Arenberg, and I, 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 I'll never forget that there's a flat road, you know, what, Johan, you take a left turn and it's a flat stretch of about two or three kilometers. You could see the whole thing. That is the hardest flat road mm-hmm. on the entire planet. You come out, your <laughs> legs are like rubber and your body's just been rattled and you're within either you come out in a good situation. You're trying to put time on your competitors or you're trying to catch up between groups and you saw what happened with Van Poel and Van Art. I mean, it doesn't get harder than that. And it's just a you flat road. Today, today you could see with Stibar. Stibar yep. was uh, with, 
I don't know who, he, who he's. He, I think he was with, yeah, with with Van Aert. He was with Van Aert, and he, he you know, he he lost two seconds to catch a bottle, and he couldn't get back. Yeah. After after Arenberg, after Arenberg. I'd like to hear uh, you guys comment on on uh, Vanderpool because he's he's such a favorite. He's such a marked guy. It seems like if he's in a break, he's doing the the, the lion's share of the work. If he's in a chase group, he's the one doing all the work. He always seems to be in a situation where he's doing most of the work. Oh, that's when you're the, when you're that guy. I mean, yeah, mm. the, that's the smart thing. I mean, it it doesn't look fair on if you're just watching TV and 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 don't know the game. But that's that's heavy as the crown, baby. I mean, if if you're the if you're that good and, and your engine is that big, you, that's what you um, that's I, what I you have to do. I think the same thing happens with Van Aert, both of those guys. Today, for example, you could see Van Aert had missed the break. And at the beginning, it was, all, it was only, only Van Aert who did the work. Nobody wanted to ride with him. They only started to work with him when they were sure that he didn't have a good day. Then yeah. they started to pull through. But, you know, I mean, both of those guys, you know, that if normally if you take them to the line, uh, they win. Yeah. Uh, unless your name is Sonny Correlli. Um, I mean... Which there was some chatter uh, on the internet, you know, as the internet does, uh, about uh, folks sort of, you know, calling him a wheel sucker and saying that he didn't he didn't do his fair share of work. And um, it's so funny. You get these folks on the internet; they, they wouldn't know a fucking cobblestone from a birthday cake. I mean, come on, like <sighs> yeah, already. I mean, Already he was a, he was ahead he was ahead of Underpool first of all yep. he he went in the in the counter attack did a lot of work there and and then when Van der Poel came and it's it's normal I mean you know that that's the big favorite you you, you, race, you base your race on him and once he saw that Van der Poel was not super I think Cobrelli did at least the same amount of work as Van der Poel yeah I, I agree maybe he was Cabrelli was there. He made the move before Vanderpool uh, and then caught that, that second or third group on the road, was working with them. And then you thought when, when Vanderpool caught up, you thought, okay, he's just going to ride away from these guys. But every time Vanderpool made a huge move, Cabrelli would come right back and, and then started pulling toe to toe with him. So I think he was uh, just as strong as him, but just maybe perhaps a tiny bit smarter and saving the energy. Mm -hmm. Before, and I want to touch on the women's pair Bay, which of course was yesterday. Um, but before we get to, to that, and then, uh, just more details of the men's race today. Uh, today's show also brought to you by Ventum, a premium bike brand launched in 2014, based right here in Utah. Guys, the Ventum crew, I'm in your home state right now. Check out my backdrop. Looks pretty amazing. That's not fake. That's real. Uh, that My go-to road machine, the NS1, my go-to gravel machine, the GS1, which I, I actually think would be a fun conversation, is to talk about I watch these you know, race like today. It's like, why wouldn't they ride gravel bikes? George, don't roll your eyes at me. I know where you're going with this, but like, I, I, I think, I think it would be a great idea to, oh, to do it on gravel bikes. Uh, anyways, Ventum, direct to consumer, uh, <laughs> awesome, uh, custom uh, fit options, everything to make it uh, perfect for you. And congrats to D and his whole crew. They just did the Wasatch all road a few weeks ago. I'm getting crazy feedback on people that did that race. Um, and I think George, we have a challenge at that race next year, but uh, congrats to the whole crew for pulling that off 30 day money back guarantee. No questions asked, head on over to VentumRacing.com and use the promo code, the move at checkout for 10% off <clears throat> last one of the day. Today's show also brought to you by athletic brewing for those that are sober curious as bill and the crew over there at athletic call it, you know, it's not, you don't, you don't have to drink alcohol every night. Well, now you have an option. And especially if you love beer and you love craft beer and you love good beer, but you're sober curious, you want to back off the alcohol a little bit. Um, athletic Brewing is your, is your, uh, is your go-to. Um, it's delicious. And they've got the new seltzer. They've got all kinds of good stuff. Also a great thing they do. They, they give back to these trail programs. 2% uh, of all sales go to uh, uh, two for the trails program, we call it. And that's uh, helps maintain trails across the country. Head on over to athleticbrewing.com. Customers get free shipping for orders of two or more six packs. And check this out, 25% off. Just use the code THEMOVE25. That's at athleticbrewing.com. Um, okay, let's, let's, before we do talk about the women's race, so, Johan, you agree with me on the, on the gravel bikes? I, I don't well, know, I, I especially thinking, I a day thinking. like today. These, these yeah. gravel bikes are fast now. Mm. 
I was thinking about that. I was thinking about that today. I said, why wouldn't you ride a gravel bike? They're a little bit longer. They're a little bit longer. I think they they have, you know, the, the frame itself, because of the geometry, has a little bit more suspension. Um, and you can put and you can put wider tires. Uh, yep. as of today, still they, they're still racing with 28 or with 30 tires. Um, I think you could use wider tires and um, of course, I mean, a race like today was ideal for a gravel bike, in my opinion. George, what do you think? I don't know. I think, uh, well, from what I heard, I think there was guys with 34 mil tires. Um, the tires were, were wide enough. Uh, let's not forget there's 50 kilometers of, of cobblestones in the Paris Bay. So the race is 260 kilometers long. So what about the other 210 kilometers where aerodynamics come into huge uh, play and uh, I, I don't think so. I think, uh, mm-hmm. road bikes all the way to go and I'll probably get hell from all the gravel community, but you know what? You haven't done Roubaix yet. And so Ooh, no talking snap. About it. It, it's like, Hey, all you, all you, you know, you, uh, armchair quarterbacks, you bunch of wimps, uh, in, by the way, I'm in that category, you know, I think, um, but, I, it makes sense to me. What do you, JB, you're, you're, let's, you be the tiebreaker here, JB. <laughs> Man, if I say anything, I look the, the most foolish of all. I have no idea. I haven't been on a gravel bike yet, so I don't know that I can answer that. What I am dying to ask George, because we everyone's talking about the emotional uh, Cabrelli. We, if you haven't seen that, it's worth just watching that. But then the emotion of Vanderpool it makes me think, would you rather lose Roubaix by two minutes instead of on the track? Because I imagine, and you've been there. Well, they were all upset. Re- I mean. Yeah. You replay, me, you must replay it in your head over and over. If this, then that, or, or you just move on. So it's funny. And when I got second in Roubaix, I got really criticized for why weren't you attacking? And we, we saw, I thought Ramesh might put in an attack, but you know what? You're at the end of a 260 kilometer race. One of the, like I keep saying over and over the hardest race on the calendar. And you're, you're pulling through with your breakaway companions at 45 Ks an hour. Like, where are you going to go when you attack? Your legs are rubber. Like you saw these guys, the sprint, they basically did the sprint in the saddle because they couldn't get out of the saddle. There's nothing left in the body. The legs cannot move. And I, I think before we go to the women's race, which is also an incredible race, the moment you saw Cabrelli with the Vermeer's put in one attack, the moment you saw Cabrelli go right after that without hesitation, because I thought that was the one chance for Vermeer to get away because they're both Vanderpool and uh, Cabrelli are two of the top sprinters in the entire world. That's the chance. One of those guys are going to go, hang on, you get him because you're fast also. Cabrera didn't even hesitate. I don't, he didn't care who was on his wheel. I'm closing this. I'm not letting anybody go. You knew he was confident. You knew he had a little bit left for that sprint, and he showed everybody that he was able to finish it off. Yeah. I also think, uh, George, I mean, no offense, because you've been you've been a lot of times in the final of, of Paris-Roubaix, but compared to, I mean, and I think that says a lot about the toughness and how hard this race really is. I think it's one of the slowest finals Absolutely. Like the last, the last 20, 25 kilometers, it's slow and everybody's just, you know, dragging themselves. I, I, I always remember, you know, when, when there was a breakaway and then finally at the end, you get permission to go to the front with the car yep. from behind little groups and you go, you have to go fast. And then you finally get to the first four or five. I was always shocked by how slow they were going. <laughs> I was like, ah, oh, you know, they, they were, they, everybody was just dead, empty. Yeah. There's, you got no- at that point in a race like we're today where it's wet and uh, positioning and stress uh, plays such a huge factor uh, in your overall, overall condition at the end, you just got, you got nothing left. It's a matter of, you know, that little last match you have left for the sprint, but it's not, nobody's making huge, huge moves there. You saw Vanderpaul try to go in and it and if he was good, as soon as he caught on to Muscant, he would have just rolled right past him, but he caught my scan and said, well, I need to recover here. Cause I got nothing left. So it's, <laughs> it's just, these guys are rolling in like uh, dead bodies there at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Speaking of uh, tough rides, Lizzie, uh, and I probably mess up the pronunciation of her name, Danan, uh, hell of a race solos for 82 kilometers wins by over a minute. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was that, 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 if we had to give away awards for the, you know, sort of seeing the douches, award that's which by the way this is probably the origin of that story that uh from Eki, like you know these the showers in at the velodrome in in roubaix are kind of legendary and, and disgusting not that i've ever been but i've seen the pictures <laughs> uh but she just she just said see you in a douches what a ride that was 
that was incredible. I mean, going after the first off, from the first uh, sector, and Mariana Vos said it, you know, and she was the the big favorite, you know, huge Palmares, uh, really great cyclocross skills. Um, this was one of her goals, and she said, you know, we all thought this was a crazy move, way too early. Um, and yeah, and they just stayed there, you know. When uh, once once Mariana Vos went, uh, she you know she could get back a little bit, a little bit, but then uh, Lizzie Dagnan was just steady, you know. It was like was it was like a machine over those cobbles. She, you know, she she was by herself, of course, no no stress uh, before in all the other sectors, and um, yeah, I mean, she was she was crazy strong. It was it was unbelievable, and and uh, almost forty kilometers average for the first the the, the first time. Uh, women's Paris Roubaix. I mean, nobody had yeah, first no ever. experience at all. Um, so for the average, uh, it was not wet, but it was muddy on some on some cobble sections. Uh, pretty impressive, really impressive. Well, not only not only muddy, but very very slippery. You saw Lizzie away on her own, mm -hmm. riding the perfect race, and she's still slipping and sliding everywhere. Um, yeah. So the fact that uh, they, although they didn't have quite as bad weather as the men, it was still very muddy, very slick, and and uh, what an incredible ride she did. She took it the bull by the horns, went early, and like you said, a lot of the riders thought she went too early. But you know, when you're on your own, like I said, you get to choose your lines, and lots of times that's the difference between winning and losing. You know what I thought? I also observed that in the men's and women's race was net, they're putting up these barricades now. You saw those like yellow. Um, yeah, maybe that's they, they've done that recently, but I don't think so. But the, to prevent the riders from getting over on the the, the smooth sides, you got to stay on the cobbles. It's just mm -hmm. brutal. Yeah, especially that last uh, second and last section where all the riders know, like, yes, okay, I got two sections left. This next one, I, got, I can ride it on the sort of the path right next to it, hopping off on and off. And that I still thought that was the case when I saw the barricades of them. I'm like, oh man, <laughs> that is just like put the nail on the heart. You know, these guys have worked so hard, and then all of a sudden they can't even ride on the path because there's barricades everywhere. Yeah, you could, you could turn the corner like, oh fuck, yeah. <laughs> who put these here? <laughs> By the way, I looked up. Uh, I looked up because uh, we were talking about the the lack of climbing in Perry Bay. I'm I'm actually surprised. I just looked up uh, Jasper Steuben's Strava file. Um, take a, take a guess at how much elevation today, George, this is your race. You, I'd say, uh, under 500 feet, try 5,375 feet. Yep. Of elevation. Yep. Wow. Where, where did they do? I would, I would have said yeah. like six, 600 meters. Yep. Yeah. It's, uh, it just, and if you look at the, the elevate or the profile, it's just kind of always, there's more than, you know, I guess if you go ride 160 miles, it doesn't, you, just, you know, a few little, but I'm, that, that's surprising to me. 5,300 yeah. vert. So, yeah. you know, on that clip that I was asking, it'd be fun if, uh, if Tiff found for us, a friend of mine just sent it to me on, uh, on the Insta. So I'll put it up and tag you guys later about when I was, uh, flatted in the Arenberg. Come on, guys, to the front there. We don't leave George alone there, right? Eh? We're back at the sharp end now, and George Hincapi of the USA is riding a brilliant race. Well, you see, when you do have the form, you ride over the cobblestones so easily. Hincapi is very relaxed here. He's picking his own line over these cobblestones. George, you're fantastic. You are fantastic, eh? Hincapi, I think, has gone down as well there. That was Hincapi just picking himself up. Wilfred Peters is riding by him right now. Don't panic, don't panic. Refind your tempo, eh? Don't panic. Very good, George. Very good, very good. At the moment, oh, you see he's slipping all over the place. He's all slipping all over the place. Paul, you're right. He's in big trouble. George is right now. George, don't panic. Don't panic. You're okay. <laughs> and Hincapi cannot get himself rolling at all. Go on, George. Go on. Go on. We cannot do anything. We're behind. George, don't panic. Don't panic. You're okay. Don't panic. You're very good. George is in all sorts of difficulty now trying to get his bike going again. I'm, I'm wondering if he's got a flat tire. Don't panic. You can handle this. You can handle this. George has got a flat tire, and there it is. This time he's taken the wheel out, and he's called up the service. Well, there he was. It's very difficult. He was riding so well. No panic at all. He waited for the neutral service there to come up and give him a front wheel, and he's up and riding. Because we got to point out, when you flat on this wet cobblestone section, you can't pedal. <laughs> There's no way, front, especially front flat, you aren't handling your bike. I don't care how good of a bike handle you are. You got to get off your bike and find a wheel as quick as possible. You, you can't pedal through that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. George, were, were you not, uh, I don't remember which year, but it's probably the year you, you crashed um, where you lost your, your handlebars. Were you not one of the pioneers with, with high rims? 
in Paris Yeah, yeah, yeah was, totally. So, yeah, so and I today, saw today everybody like everybody's everybody, got them every, now. Yeah. Every everybody everybody's riding them, and also for the women's race, I think this is also a first um, that uh, Lizzie Lizzie Dagnan won Paris Roubaix uh, with a single chainring in the front. I yeah. think that's a first for for a, a big classic. And not that you need it, but you know, it's one it's one less component that can go wrong. You know. Um, so yeah, so for, uh, one one cha- one chain ring and uh, yeah, I was very we, nice. We would we would put I think forty sixes on our small you know small chain rings when we were racing. But yeah, like you're right. I think you'd use it maybe once throughout the entire day. But no, I mean no, especially nowadays. Back then, I remember we put forty six or some of, or even forty eight. Yeah. Uh, to have a to have a difference because you know the 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 cassettes were not. Not yeah. that uh, that that large, uh, but but nowadays you just need one chain ring. So, um, yeah, that was that was uh, that was the first I think in a big classic. Yo, know, and I'm just looking at the results here. This so this kid who kind of comes out of nowhere, Florian Vermish. Is mm-hmm. he a brother? There's another Vermish in the race. It's no, on. No, no, they're not related. No, 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 they're not. And then related. as I and then as I just keep looking down here, you see in 18th place, Armory Capio. Is that uh, Johan Capio? I think that's the son of Johan Capio. I that's think. amazing. Yeah. Oh. This is yeah. when you start to get old. You start looking down at this shit. <laughs> yeah. and you're like, you yeah, know. Then there's for, and Van Hoydonk. Is that uh, any relation to? Edward? That's the that's his nephew. That's uh, that's so you know his brother was a professional also. Um, I don't remember his first name now. Uh, Gino Gino Van Hoydonk was a professional also, and that's his son, not not Nathan Nathan. And Van then Hoydonk. you start to see all these names. You've got Baptiste Plankert. I mean, now you talk about a uh, probably the most iconic to- family in Belgian cycling. I mean, how many Plankerts have come to the professional yeah, peloton? Not, not 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 related. Cool, that makes it awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that's I was start, just nobody knows this stuff. Just say yeah, 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 like, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Eve Eve Lampert. What, Eve Lampert and uh, fit, any relation to, no. to which, okay. which, by the way, uh, Eve was on a spectacular day today. Mm-hmm. Also had you know victim to bad luck, but yeah, um, you know, arguably he could have definitely been up there in the first three as well. I think I think that's that's one of the one of the remarkable events of today that we you know, the Koenig quick step was not a factor in no. the race at all uh, due to bad luck. But you know, normally they always have four or five guys in the big selection, but uh, but today they were. They were not even close. He got fifth, right? But Lampard got fifth yep, or sixth. Yep, he got fifth. Yeah, he got fifth. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, mm-hmm. anything else we got to cover, fellas? I know George, you got a swanky brunch you got to get to. Uh, no, I just like, like I keep saying, I think that was a super, super exciting race uh, from the beginning with the battle for positions to the first cobblestone sections, which a lot of people don't even see. They don't wake up to watch it here, especially on this side of the pond, but. You know, those moments I remember so, so vividly from my career is like, you know, you got 150 Ks of a normal sort of bike race, a couple of rolling hills, the breakaway is gone. But in a wet Roubaix, when you're coming onto that first section, you're like, the shit is going to hit the fan. There's people on sidewalks, there's people crashing everywhere. And if you you know that if you don't enter that first section in the first 20, you may never see the front again in, in the entire race. So That's right. there's so many races within the race of Roubaix and it's just, uh, you know, it was an incredible race to watch today. You know, on the heels of watching you guys ride in Mallorca with uh, Jan Ulrich, by the way, if you haven't listened or watched that episode, you should. Uh, maybe you can fulfill this lifelong dream for Lance, George, and take him in and do the Roubaix course, just the two of you. <laughs> I doubt he'd want to do it, but uh, I'm down <laughs> if he wants to do it. That but could be our next you, to move camp. But you've taken people over there. You know, people said, oh, I just want to ride the Arnberg. I mean, th- these are people that ride regularly. I, They'll yeah, go over I, they will do the 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 force of Aaron Burke and I mean they get halfway and they're like, okay, <laughs> fuck uh-huh. this. All right, I got it. I seen it. I'm done. Like you just cannot imagine. And even, you know, we did do stages in the tour some of those years that were on cobbles. I mean, this was like cobblestone light. Like they were people would freak out. Everybody was nervous, fight for position. Um, you know, I had, you know, George and Eki just sort of just shepherding me through this stuff, but it's uh nothing compared to just how yeah. gnarly. I mean, I saw some images on the internet where people were, you know, just to give you a sense for the gaps or the, 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 the spacing between the cobbles or how, you know, people had like Coke cans in there that were, they'd sit in and they were flush. Like, how do yeah. you, like you put a wheel in there, you know, the people <laughs> well, stacked of, up, stacked up three Oreos. You really, you really have to have seen it from close by. I mean, no matter what, if you see, if you watch it on TV, you watch 
pictures. You cannot have an idea of how difficult this is. You have to have been there and then you get there, at least for the first time when you get there, you get, how can they ride bikes over this, over these yeah. paths? You know, it's, yeah. it's that bad. It's that bad. And I'm guessing there's, there's no slow going over it. That's even worse, right? You have to have the momentum, right, George? Oh, especially if it's wet. Yeah. Cause if you're going slow, it's so easy to slide off of that crown. So you got to have the momentum. Uh, you got to worry about people crashing in front of you. You got to worry about people crashing into you. Like we saw in the Ironberg. Um, there's just so many things going on in that race that it's, it's, it's unlike any other race in the calendar. No, well, I'm glad I, I'm glad I avoided it. I got zero. Well, I have a, I have a lot of regrets in my life. As I sit here and reflect on 25 years being cancer free, uh, I, I got no regrets on missing this race. No. I mean, I, I I joined your club, Lance. I've, I also uh, have the honor to have never raced Paris Roubaix. Yeah, well, that's because you're a wheel sucker in the <laughs> and a quacker and a qua- uh, right. and a quacker rock. Yeah, <laughs> but ne- but Nita Panakuk, huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <coughs> we well, I guess we're back. next weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Next week. Uh, 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 you know, cause we were looking at the family calendar and I have it in there, you know, uh, Lombardia is on most of these iconic, um, classic races. The monuments are on Sundays. Oh no, not in Italy. Milan San Remo on a Saturday tour Lombardia on a Saturday. So we'll be back on a Saturday. It almost looked like a typo. I was like, wait, Oh yeah. Boom. <laughs> hmm. Right. Okay, cool. That was great. I'm glad you guys agreed with that. that. That was a really interesting factoid, Lance. We'll be there. We'll be there. Yeah, we'll be, be there. there. Uh, cool. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. And uh, we'll see you next Saturday. That wraps it up. Thanks, guys. Ciao. Ciao, ciao.